Hi, I'm Dirk Friel, co-founder of Training Peaks, and you're listening to the Training Peaks Coachcast. My guests today are Joy and Brian McCulloch, the husband and a wife team behind Big Wheel Coaching. They started their business in 2010. Joy was a high school PE teacher and professional mountain biker, and her vision behind Big Wheel Coaching was to bring PE to adults by providing structure, feedback, and accountability to athletes. Brian has over 15 years of professional road, mountain bike, and gravel racing experience, and he currently races for Bianchi Gravel Team. I hope you enjoy the show and can gain some insight into how to become race ready. Brian and Joy McCulloch of Big Wheel Coaching, thank you so much for joining me today on the CoachCast. Yeah, thanks for having us. We're excited to be here, Dirk. Yeah, we were just chatting it up about you're in the, the garage gym. Is that what it is? Garage office gym? Yes, it's uh, D all of the above. We've got Zwift set up over that way. We've got right behind us is a uh, squat rack. Um, Brian's kits are hanging over there and his desk is behind us and a bunch of bikes are over there. That's awesome. It's the quietest in- place in the house. <laughs> I know, man. Authentic, authentic. It's where you spend your all your days. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> time. Right. Yeah, it's going to get hot in here soon, but yeah, we hang out here a lot. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for joining me. I mean, you guys have been on Training Peaks for a long time, and you've been doing some really cool, innovative stuff that I've been hearing about recently. And uh, tell us about, you know, how is it going with your athletes in terms of like their calendars, their race calendars getting full, or you know, how is it now compared to a year ago with uh, what your athletes are focused on? Well, that's a, a good question. You know, like everyone uses this term pivot really big here during during the pandemic and we've done like a 180 in terms i would say like maybe quarter four last year was like the the calendar was like condensed it was like two seasons in quarter four wow so everyone's like we're racing crits and then tomorrow i'm going to go to mountain bike race and then i'm going to do a cycle cross it was it was a little bit bananas as things began to open up yeah. and as we entered here into 2022 the schedule like got lengthened, like, like drawn out a little bit more. So it's more of a traditional, like you would expect of a, of a racing calendar that we've become so comfortable with. Yeah. Um, and so we've had to really move our business focus. We've been really um, pliable during the pandemic to see which direction we were going to flow, you know, and we were letting the clients kind of lead us. Like some of them were very apprehensive to go to events because of COVID or, travel, all these limitations, things came up that we had never experienced before. Um, and I'm part of a coaching mastermind. Yeah. It's mostly fitness professionals. So I'm the only endurance athlete and coach there. So they all like own gyms and, and um, very creative on that aspect. But one of the main things that they're teaching me is like, hey, let's set a theme for the year. And so Brian and I, when we started looking into 2022, we were like, well, what theme is going to help drive our business and help our athletes the most. And that's where Brian kind of came up with the idea of, you know, we're working with athletes that are now getting back into the trenches of racing and they're so terrified. Like, it's like, we're all came out of retirement and are like, I'm going to go race my first like big Ironman or Criterium or road race. And I haven't towed a line since 2019. (laughs) Um, So the stress level is very high. And so Brian came up with the idea of race day ready. Yeah, we what we wanted to do, Dirk, is, you know, we from a coaching standpoint, I always think of it like race day performance. Like we're going to do, we invest all this time, money, effort, and sacrifice for our athletes. They're all so they're one hundred percent committed, and then it can all fall apart on race day because of a nutrition challenge, or because yeah. of a bike issue, or maybe it's a skill issue that we couldn't uncover in the training process. And so what we came up with race day ready was, hey. That's the day that matters. And so if, if uh, I'm sorry here, I'm a little deficient here, but a lot of people are stick and ball athletes or they know that uh, kind of sport and game day is like everything. There's yeah. just that that fervor that's associated with it. And we definitely have that as bike racers and, and uh, endurance sport uh, athletes. But really, um, I wanted to try and harness that game day mindset into race day ready and make it a really positive thing to help disseminate or, or, or really kind of diffuse some of the anxiety and help everyone be like, I'm comfortable, I'm confident, and I'm ready to give my best. And hey, at the end of the day, 
we're, you've got a coach, you've got support. We're going to pick up the pieces and we're going to move forward because there's always another event and we're going to keep building. Yeah. I mean, it's so true. There's so much focus on the, the intervals of the day or the, the Zwift workout and all the blood, sweat kind of tears in between the races, but then race yeah. day comes and it's like, you only get to practice that maybe twice a year for some athletes, right? Yeah. Um, other athletes, what might be doing cyclocross and all kinds of stuff and they may get 20 days a year. So they get more practice at it. Um, Brian, I know you started out taking your athletes and that, you know, this is a, a great thing that any coach should think about doing, but working with athletes, setting the goals for the year, didn't you do some mm-hmm. exercise where you kind of took your athletes aside and spent an evening with them and went through an exercise to, to set goals together? During pandemic, everyone was moving the goalpost. So our goals just were always changing. And so it made it very nebulous for some people. They were kind of like just going through the process. And when yeah. this year looked, okay, we're going to be able to have in-person events. We're going to be able to do these things again. What I thought about was, let's come back to our roots. Let's come back to foundational principles and let's set some goals. Let's assess ourselves. I always like to use like athlete SWAT. So like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's worked great for us in business and it works so well for our athletes. I have a little uh, thing that we created, uh, PDF, that just allows them to assess their own strengths, their own weaknesses, their own opportunities and potential threats for, for this. And if they can apply that to now how we build out the season, it helps me as a coach, but it also helps them in the moment. Because I always think, why are we doing this? Why am I going to do this interval? We have a lot of our athletes, like I'm sure many of the athletes listening to this, like, why am I doing this 10 minute interval? Why am I, why am I doing under overs again? These hurt so bad. Why am I getting up at five o'clock in the morning to get on Zwift? Because here's why. And so when we can have goals, when we can understand why we're doing something, you say, well, I want to be a better climber. Well, that means I need to do these climbing repeats. And so it makes them more committed to the process and in a very organic, authentic, natural way, because we are committed to their success. And I want sometimes we're pulling for them harder than they are. Right. And and that's not a dig on them. It's like they live busy and full lives. So I wanted to give them away so that in that moment when they needed something from us and I couldn't be there for them, that they had some connection to be like, I can do this well, and I'll get the, it done. The like community aspect. So that we, we hosted this that is called the energy lab. It's in Redlands on the crit course. Okay. On that straight array, like right after you would come to the finish line before you do the right hand turn, there's a place called the energy lab. And you know, cause I've seen you do this yeah. race, right? You, the, the energy lab is she and I started our businesses at the same time in 20, not 2009. And we've collaborated over the years and actually Brian coming over to work with me at Big Wheel in 2016 was a product of sitting down and doing a goal setting session with Jill at the Energy Lab of your BHAGs. What's your big, hairy, audacious dream? Like, what what is this thing that would be like, Brian's like, I want to stop working in construction and I want to help guide people. And how that sifted down was he's going to become a coach with me and we're going to work in tandem. So over the years, we've really relied on that relationship. And she's always like, hey, come host. Things are open. We have this new space. And so we're like, our clients really thrive when we're in this space together. Okay. Yeah. Phone is great. Zoom is moderate at best <laughs> to connect with people. But they're like, we can go have lunch, go for a bike ride and sit down and I can write down my goals and a coach can talk to me about it or another athlete. You can meet someone, you can meet a peer and now like, Hey, we both want to go do the Belgian waffle ride 30 mile race. Perfect. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you have a buddy system. So doing that collaboration and Brian did a great job on the, the outline is like, what are your, um, to assess your season? Like yeah. how did your season Last go? Season. Right. Yeah. yeah. How did it go last year? And a lot of people like we're, we're shooting zeros. Right. right. A bunch yeah, of know, I would, I would always open up the annual training plan, you know, after a race and make a comment in the annual training plan, like the comments, like a uh, column of like, you know, kind of my thoughts or what the athletes, you know, athletes thoughts were on how it went or, you know, when they got sick, right. When they got injured. And then we could go back after the season when we're going to set next season's goals. And we would review, you know, last season's annual training plan. And all of our notes are kind of there. They're accumulating throughout the year. So kind of help guide that conversation. So 
whether you're doing it, you know, training peaks, annual training plan, or somehow just kind of keep that dialogue and like written, keep it written and, and shared between the athlete and coach that I always really like that working with my athletes. No, it's yeah. awesome. I love it. You know, one thing we did that, um, on that day. So we got everybody together. We had a bike ride. We led two different bike rides because we have, co we coach people from all kind of different fitness abilities. So we kind of had people that were more racy and then we had people that were more fitness minded. And so Joy led a ride and I led a ride. We went out and did two hours. Everybody got their wiggles out. Then we came back. I had lunch provided for them. So as soon as they get back, there's lunch, you know, they can change, have lunch. And then what we did, you can see behind me right here, <laughs> is these wall calendars. So I had 25 wall calendars all taped to the wall, <laughs> and all they're over, they're and they're all clocked. Executive coaching. Right. <laughs> well, and so what we did was we went through it together. So like Joy yeah. had one up, I had one up, everyone in the room had one, everyone had pens, and it was like, okay guys, as I'm walking us through, let's first put down everything on the calendar. So not only do we have our annual training plan through Training Peaks that is a way for us one-on-one -on -one to be able to do that, but in that moment, they have a visual at home that they can put in their pain cave. They can put where they get dressed. They can put wherever. The family sees it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the family. But that's a great point, Dirk, and, and you really hit it with all of your experience because we want them to have a community of people behind them, not just friends they can ride with, but right. how is their spouse understanding? Why are you going to go do a four or five hour bike ride today and take time away from the family? Because that's the goal. That's what we're working on. And now the family's behind it. And it's like, you know, Hey mom, there's only three weeks to your big race. Are you ready? And you're like, yeah, I am. And so it's yeah. really great for people to have a physical something in their hand that they could walk away with and say, this is what, this is why I'm doing this. And then involve other people in the process, both family, friends, training partners, coaches, et cetera. Well, right. And on the goal, sorry. And on the goals, are you setting objectives? I mean, there could be the goal to podium at nationals, yeah. but how are we going to get there? Right. Yeah, and so like, what objectives wow. are we going to shoot for? Well, and you asked them, like, it was very interesting. Like I sit across the table and I'm like, well, that's awesome. What are you going to do? And like some of the, the trainings I've taken over the years, like, you know, as a behavior change specialist certified through ACE, right? Because I want to get like CEUs behavior change. I just be like, well, Brian, how do you think you're going to get there? Instead of me providing Brian, like, so Brian, you need to do X, Y, and Z. It's like, no, what do you think is your next step? And so many people are like, I don't know. I don't know. Like yeah. it, it, it's, it's a very, sometimes you feel like you're banging your head against the wall and I'm like, well, that's a really cool goal, but why don't I outline maybe some of the path, you know, and we're really strong on collaboration with the athlete, specifically our athletes are most over 30 years old, right? They're working class. They have a busy lives and they're not looking for a taskmaster. Okay. They want to be validated and be like, Dirk, that's a great idea. Or, you know, your, your daughter's going to prom this weekend or doing this, that, and the other. So that's a weekend off for you. So you're set up for success with the family. So there's a ton, there's a very high level of collaboration, meaning Brian is athletes in the driver's seat. And I'm here to help guide him. And when I used to teach for um, TPU stuff, I talk about like the uh, bowling with bumpers. Yeah. Right. So you're going to bowl. We're all going bowling, but I'm going to make sure Brian doesn't roll a gutter ball. Right. He <laughs> might not get a strike. But he's not a gutter ball. Okay? You may not improve your, your FTP by 30%. Let's 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 see what might be realistic this year. We'll, we'll you might not, so maybe that win is that you didn't drop it by 2%, yeah. right? Maybe your FTP stayed, st stayed stable, but seeing like, hey, we're here to kind of help guide. And like, sometimes it's not the best idea, but the athletes kind of like set on it and to say, hey, okay, this is, in order to read, you know, process goals are really helpful because if I just wanted to do dirty uh, unbound, okay, if I wanted to do unbound, that's really a long ways away, okay, and a lot I can fail on that day. So if an athlete's like, I'm going to do the 200 at unbound, I'm like, great, you need to do at least five big gravel starts before you get there, okay? Let's start picking them. We're going to pick them based on terrain, temperature. Um, elevation it's not at elevation so we don't have to go to colorado right so mm -hmm. be like okay cool if you want to do that here's some of the process to get there and then when they have that mapped out um their confidence goes up or their belief or their buy-in can be much higher instead of like hey i have until when is it july 
June and you're going to get off track. And all of a sudden you'd be like, oh, I haven't really been training, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. back to race. Good. What was that? Oh, I'm going to say, I'm sorry. The, that's why that calendar looks good because you can, just like we do in training piece, you know, we know that it's 10 weeks to our event or it's two weeks to our prep event, this kind of stuff. So that was kind of where the race day ready mindset came about was from the goal setting thing. Cause now we can go, wait a second, what are the things we have to learn at those preparatory events to make sure that we arrive at our goal event with robust fitness, tons of confidence and the skill set necessary to be successful. Yeah. Well, I hadn't seen that done before, like a huge wall calendar, but I, what I love about it is that family aspect and the spouse, you know, so the whole family can see what's coming up and really understand more of, you know, the why behind everything. So um, I think that's, that's genius right there. Thank you. Yeah. And we found actually in the pandemic, we were really nervous, Dirk, when it started. Right. When you're seeing layoffs, you're seeing we yeah. just batten down the hatches and we're just like waiting, like what's going to happen. Um, and the interesting thing is our client load increased by 46 percent during the pandemic. Wow. Because people want structure, accountability and feedback. And yeah. that's what we created the business on in 2009. You had all of these people that all of a sudden became very aimless and rudderless. having rudder, they didn't have a rudder. They didn't have that guide. And they no goal. all of a sudden they're working from home and there's all these people at home. There's all these things, there's these pets, there's laundry. Like, so having a coach, it kind of set the cornerstone of like, Hey, today, Dirk, I want you to go do this one hour effort. And it, it was very interesting because it set the tone for the household. Now, all of right. a sudden we had one constant Dirk, dad's going to go ride his bike for one hour at 2 PM. Okay, now we can kind of build around that. And it was, I, I would even program, and I've been doing this forever, but be like, you know, it's, think, it's Christmas time and I had a client in San Diego. Hey, your workout today is walk the neighborhood with your wife and son and check out the holiday lights. <laughs> like that's your workout. And then yeah. he's like, you know, my son was so pumped that he, I was on, I made his training plan today. And it's like very easy. Like this workout literally doesn't matter on the ATP at all. Right. But having that buy in from his group was like, Dad, I made your work, your training plan today. Or, or you know, his his We're wife was it. like, hey, she rides an e-bike. I'm like, dude, go crush it with your wife today. She's oh. going to lead you out for your intervals on the yeah. e-bike. And the more you incorporate. So then we had this we had to hire another coach because our client retention was so high. And then we started backloading. We had like a wait list wow. of people that were like, hey, we want to be part of somebody who's literally vested in us having a, a positive experience that the trickle down is very wide. Yeah, absolutely. I'm one of those folks that bought an e-bike during <laughs> yeah. the pandemic for my wife, Yeah, but she does not get the concept. So I'm at 500 Watts on every single climb and then she <laughs> coasts and I drop her every descent. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She's I'm riding too, a 40 pound bike and dropping you or you're dropping yeah, her. She, wants to, she wants to suffer. I know. I get my intensity, not in Zwift, but uh, bike riding with my wife. Yeah, um, good. Yeah. So, on, you know, you guys have started actual in-person clinics as well. I know you have race day ready clinics that are the day before the race as well as the morning of the race. So is that it depends. something yeah, you work on? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Dirk. It just depends on the event. So because we've been doing it so long, we have a really good relationship with local and regional um, event promoters. And so what I do is, you know, I've been going to their races for a long time. I just called them and I asked them, you know, how how is business for you guys? And I would ask them and they would say, man, you know, it's really hard to get people to stay. Everybody wants to come in, they do their event and they leave. And so what we were thinking about was how can I provide value to them and enhance our athletes experience? So the way that I look at the world and bring is, more athletes in. well, exactly. But the way that we look at the world is there's no stadium for what we do. There's in your local town, there's a ball field, there's a soccer, there's all the stuff, but there's no place to do what we do except on the roads or on the trails. So these race promoters, they create the stadium. Well, our athletes need goals. If they go away or there's some issue, we have a problem, right? Yeah. So I want yeah. to enhance their business. We are aligned. We want to help them, right? And by us helping them, it helps us. 
right? Yeah. And so I just called them and I said, hey guys, I would like to do either, like for a big gravel event, what we do is we would do, it's race day ready, but we do just an, a proper easy spin. And what I, like, you like know the day this- before. Yeah, you know this as a roadie, right? Like, you know, from all your years of racing, Dirk, what a proper recovery coffee spin looks like, okay? <laughs> the problem is we were coaching people that were going on all these um, pre-race rides and they're at the pace of whatever pro or whatever, you know, influencer is leading it instead of yeah. for our folks. So I wanted to- point eight IF, like, shakeout ride. And you're like- yeah. Right? Oh and, yeah. man. <laughs> and so what we did was I just said, hold on, just stop here. Just stop. All I care about are my athletes and their success. So I want to make it for them. Okay. And so we went to the race promoter and we said, Hey, we would like to offer a, an opportunity for us to talk about the course, the things that they would experience out on course, which is very important for gravel. And there's still time to make some changes. Maybe it's tire pressure, et cetera that you can make to your bike, but now you have some expert guidance that's helping you. And then we teach them, this is a proper recovery ride, or this is a proper shakeout. These are the, the, the efforts that you're gonna do. Here's not too much, because again, as you know, most people do too much or they do too little. So how do we find that Goldilocks sweet spot? So that was like, for gravel events, we wanted to do that. For mountain bike events, we did actual skill sessions on single track. We did things on off camber turns, et cetera, so that we gave people skills and confidence for them to be successful at maybe the critical elements of that course that would be decisive the next day. Well, and the, and the thing with the mountain bike one, we did it the morning of, and you might be thinking like, well, that's really like, they A literally lot. finished like 32 minutes before their race. Like what's the retention? Like how much can you soak in? And so over the years of teaching like skills clinics or one-on-one -on -one stuff, like if you can have three things, Okay, that adds a takeaway as an athlete that you can quickly implement. And we keep it very simple, especially like think about turning a, um, a, a switchback on a mountain bike. Number one thing is your line of sight. Okay, just start there. Keep it very, and even like descending on the gravel bike, what are you looking at? And I can tell just by looking at the back of someone's helmet, like exactly where they're looking and they are not looking ahead or through the turn. So you say, let's get you a start, especially mountain bikes. How are you going to get off the line? Okay. Can you clip in? Why are you staring at your pedal? Right? So we, we help them like, let's go through a couple starts. Let's we're at the start line at the venue while the people are registering and we're counting down and you're going to go really hard for 20 seconds. That's a warm up. Okay. And then you're going to come back. Did you clip in? Oh, you didn't. You're totally fine. You made it through the first turn and you weren't even clipped in. Like you're a rebel, <laughs> like you're a rule breaker. Um, so seeing like, and then t telling them line of sight, just how to like enter and exit a turn. And then they can implement that throughout the course. And the other thing we had them do was eat. So like simply like if yeah. you're standing here listening to us to talk, eat something right now. I literally, I don't care if you eat a donut. Okay. <laughs> like you just eat calories. Okay. Yeah. Get something in you. And we had that one actually, it was really interesting because we did that. We probably had about 15 or 20 people. They had to come early. It's like 7 a.m. Yeah. It was like 15 bucks. Um, and they ended up. They're like, I felt so much more confident just at mm -hmm. ease. I saw some of the terrain. I felt what, what it was like. And it's so different than on the road because you're changing all these surfaces on my tires. Like I was in sand and then I was on a rock and then I went to asphalt. And that confidence of just what those sensations are like, especially for a more novice rider, it's really stressful. And helping alleviate that stress of, hey, at the start line, you're going to feel like your eyes are burning and telling them that that's normal. So like, think back to criteriums, make it three laps, Dirk, and you're going to be fine. Yeah. If you can stay in the, in the pack at that Redlands Classic Crip for three laps, <laughs> you're going to be fine. It slows down, your body acclimates, lactic acid gets out, but give them that like peace of mind, like the first five, 10 minutes of a mountain bike race, you might want to quit. You're like, yeah. I can't do this. So getting yeah, so a little are, bit of a buffer, it, it was super helpful. Are you are you are you actually holding them back in a way? Like it's gonna start really fast. You know, it's okay to let people get ahead and like go, you know, like ease into it, you know, and give them that confidence that they don't have to go all out. Yeah, to say like you can you can tractor a lot of stuff back or being okay 
if you go all out and then slow down. Cause sometimes it's like, it's, you're taking a risk. So it depends on the athlete too. Maybe some of mine that I know, um, have more depth, like my CTL is higher. Okay. So for me personally, my CTL is awful. It used to be much better. So I can't go, I have to ride it myself back in. Now my athletes who have a higher CTL can go like dump the tank at the start and recover much more quickly. Right. And so it's okay for them. They can squander their Watts a little bit more than someone who's a little less robust fitness then they have to kind of ride into it and they'll pass me. We might finish at the exact same spot, right? So I might catch her as she's coming backwards. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll kind of convene here, but the tax on the system, we can make it much less for each of us. Right. So now pacing for mountain bike versus gravel. Now gravel tends to be longer, yeah. you know, mountain bike cross country, shorter, um, you know, walk me through a gravel pacing. What would you be looking at within the course mm -hmm. and advising the athlete to think about in terms of pacing? One thing we wanted to do, Dirk, with Race Day Ready was we wanted to give people an insight to what really well-developed athletes do. Okay. And again, I know all your years of racing, you, we maybe take it for granted that you look at the course you look at the layout, where the feed zones are. You look at where's that first climb. What's the wind likely going to be? Is there a choke right. point on the road? Something like that. Okay. And a yeah. lot of, especially with all the influx of new gravel riders, they haven't had that road experience where it's like, if you don't get to 30 K where that climb is, and if you're not in the first 10, it's over. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of layers here that I would want to kind of talk through for anyone, whether they're a coach or an athlete that are listening. But the thing that's important to us is starting with what does the route look like? And then we start overlaying your goals and your fitness. And that's where the individual uh, understanding of the athlete and the coach and the coach's experience is so important, right? Because yeah. with some mountain bike racing, for example, the race very well could be the first three minutes of the race into the single track. And then after that, it's just a formula one race and everyone's just following each other around. Okay. Yeah. Or like a gravel event, it could be totally different. You could have this long buildup into the first sector, which is 20 or 30 or 40 miles in. And then all of a sudden it's well, chaos. We had, we had eight miles in Bakersfield of asphalt before you turn left on dirt. Yeah. So right. I'm going to stay with the group on asphalt, like stay with the horsepower. You know, yeah. and so for us, we, we've had the opportunity of riding, being on so many of these courses over the years, um, and then also now having clients so we can look at historical data, data, historical data, whether it's one of my old files, like great example, they did the San Dimas stage race this last weekend. It's been mm. dormant. It's been gone. It's called something else, but they did that circuit. And um, there's so many crash opportunities on that course, <laughs> right? What like, opportunities? No, bad. Yeah, no, they're like... It's, <laughs> Easy. There's so much yep. road furniture. There's roots in the asphalt. And I don't need, like, you have to make this kind of calculated decision, like looking at these courses, how much do you divulge to the athlete, right? Do I tell them like all of these scary things they're going to see at this rock descent at mile 40? Or do I just say, hey, stay to the left of the road. Just trust me because on the right of the road, there's a tons of like roots, you know, going through Benelli that it's going to, like grenade the group. So looking at what the client can handle as far as Intel, is going to be super important too. Yeah. You know, the, the complexity of gravel is it, there, there's so many layers to it, right. to making sure that they're set up. And I think the one at Bakersfield, yeah. you did a lot of work, get them set. Right. And it, to, to back to it, Dirk, sorry, I got a little off track sorry. there, but right. well, essentially we, I always like to look at what are the athletes goals and yeah. not just what are their goals, what's their fitness? Because you brought up a really good point is do you unroll the carpet and start at your pace and build throughout this event or do you just go from the gun? Okay. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't realize, or at least maybe many athletes don't realize is that these gravel events, you're not starting with your peers. When you're in a mountain bike race, the master's guys goes with the master's guys. The kids go with the kids, the juniors, all that stuff. The elites go with the elites. But in a gravel race, you're now on the start line with literally world-class talent 
Okay, they get paid to ride their bicycles and then firefighter Johnny. And firefighter Johnny's like, hey, I'm off work for three days. I want to do an 80 mile gravel race. Great. Okay. And so what we try to do is help people understand what would be the best outcome for them. And we have to recognize, and you know this as a coach, right? When people feel good, what do they do? They go hard, right? When people feel good, they go hard. But in an 80 mile or a 90 or 100 mile bike race, we all know that you're going to have bad moments. And it's all about how you recover from those bad moments and how you minimize uh, their impact on you, right? And so what we want to do is put the athlete in control, give them the confidence that like, hey, unroll the carpet, start at your pace. It's okay that we're going to let everybody go. And then we're going to ride them back. And then start eating. Like that's the thing too. You look a lot at, you know, with the race day ready, we think about what are my, what are the demands of competition? That's a, I, I key that term all the time. What are the demands of your competition? It's much different to go do literally like a 12 mile mountain bike race or a 90 mile gravel race. And some of our athletes like that gravel race, that TSS say it's 380 or 480 TSS. And it's an eight hour ride. This athlete trains eight hours a week. Yeah. So the demands of your competition is literally insane. Like you're going to do more TSS. And that's kind of the thing we've been, been battle, not battling, but looking at with gravel, with these long adventure things is like, when are you going to go do, the training for that. And so then looking at being temperate and literally eating your way through this event, you know, all of a sudden it's going to be hot. You're going to be in humidity or looking Mm -hmm. at the external elements of if you don't eat in that first 90 minutes, which most people don't because it's fast or it's cooler, I'm not sweating. So I wasn't drinking. And then literally the wheels come off and you can almost see like this two different files. Here's your heart rate and power yeah. for decoupling. I'm, I'm going to hang on with Brian. I'm here. I'm here to like, holy cow, lights out. Oh, I should start eating and yeah. <laughs> survival. Survival. Yeah. My longest race, races of the year, the first hour dictates the the final sixth hour. Yes. You know what I mean? There's a line back to the first hour. And now, I mean, I keep it simple. I have to finish this water bottle and have a gel like in the first <laughs> hour because Cause I know that's going to be 90 grams of carbs. You know what I mean? Like I just, I got to get that in the first hour, no matter what. And then I, I, what are your thoughts on like a, a nutrition type of schedule or drink to thirst or, you know, what do you, how do you advise athletes in these longer hundred mile type type events? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I always think, again, this is where I think the race aim ready mindset. What we're trying to do is figure out the exact thing for that single day. Okay. So for example, with gravel, it's very difficult when you're bouncing around to get your stuff out. So what we try to do is say, okay, let's say you have to have two bottles in you by the, before the asphalt, you know, before the first sector, or you have to have a bottle in you before that first sector. So that gives them a target and an end date. And you go, okay, like in your case, we know in that first hour, we need to have a bottle and a gel. And something they can easily get in. And you know, the old adage, like, when you're hour six, you're not going to digest anything. Because I had one gentleman yeah. was like, I was pounding. I had so many calories. And I'm like, well, that sounds horrible. Like, how's your gut? And he's like, and then it was like lights out at like 90 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, because you were overfed and it's not assimilating. So working each athlete is very different. Like Brian eats much differently than I do on the bike. And finding for them what their recipe is. Yeah. So again, I was trying to get landmarks for our athletes yeah. and what are those landmarks, because most of them haven't done the event before, or the event is so grand, like you're saying, there's been no pre-ride opportunities. So by giving them landmark opportunities, we can say, all right, you know, and like you said, there's the other option. We could just set a timer on the Garmin. Like yeah. you hear that thing go off. Cause again, you're in a pack of people, right. And you're like, Oh, Oh, you're so tuned in. You're so focused. And Hey, I'm so happy everyone's focused, but we still got to think like 20,000 foot view and single track. We have to be able to like zoom in and zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. So it's like Garmin goes off, drink that bottle. Well, what I've seen too, a lot with gravel is it's unlike, you know, when we're racing road, I have our, my feeders are in the feed zone. I can, I can, unless I drop it, I know I'm going to get a bottle at the aid station, right? Gravel. It's a free for all, right? People are literally, some people stop, some people don't. And there are some people, some people are wearing hydration packs and going through. Well, some people, their game plan is to attack in the feed zone. 
And so like I did it, the gravel event we did here, the Redland Stratarosa, I was with three ladies and we're probably, you know, 40 minutes in, I was like, Hey, I'm stopping at mile 22. I'm drinking all of my, my two bottles and I'm going to refuel, <laughs> like stick together. Yeah. So like I had a plan and not that I'm going to inflict it on them, but I'm like, I am going to stop. But I'm more saying that to myself, like you're going to stop. You're going to stop. Like it's don't okay. know, because if it's they okay. leave me, what we see with our athletes and what I've done over and over again, I get a little overconfident or I'm a little like afraid I'm going to stay with them. I want to stay with them. And then my, I'm like, I, I, I didn't do my pacing strategy, but having the athlete really buy in, like this is for you because you have to eat. Your food is at that table. If you don't eat your hose, like it's going to be 20 degrees hotter. You're working so hard. And just because like Jane Doe keeps going, we're with the horsepower, we're going to catch her. So working yeah. so a lot of it is a confidence for the athlete to be like, this is your plan and you have to fuel. And so many times they're like, I just couldn't help it. Or this guy I was with just kept going. And, I'm like, and how did it go for him? Okay. Well, yeah. It ruined you. <laughs> I've had both experiences where I am there to race and I have to imagine what the group will do and yes. what, which aid stations will they most likely skip? And so how do I prepare for skipping that aid station? And it exactly worked like that. They skipped the first aid station. So I had to, I had to start with three water bottles, you know, two on yeah. the bike and one in my pocket. Yep. And after 45 minutes, you know, I threw one away and I still had two left and that allowed me to skip the first, but then I've done, you know, a newbie in a triathlon and my goal in the aid stations was I had to, my, my goal was to walk every aid station and drink Coke. You know what I mean? And <laughs> I was going to run outside of the aid stations, but I am such a newbie. I need to get this in and hydration. And so I would walk every single aid station just to make sure that was my plan. You know what I mean? And like you're saying, Joy, like you got to get this in, let the group go. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a, the proof's in the pudding in a lot of it. Like meaning that people are like, no, 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 no. And then, you know, then they have the success and it's a light bulb. Like, oh, you know, Coach Brian said, eat every, I'm like, it's like a bird feeder. Okay. It's the drip system. Yeah. Eat, eat. I literally open all my gummy stuff, leave them empty in my back pocket. And like <clears throat> 15 minutes in, I eat it. 15 minutes in, eat it. So it's like my packages are open and it's, you think that sounds remedial, but people don't think about that. All they've thought about is like, I'm going on a gravel adventure. And it's like, right. did you open your food? No. Well, all my food was in my burrito bag. I'm like, why? That thing's terrible. Like that's, <laughs> you want, can you leave your snacks on your person? Stuff them under your Jersey. I don't care, but you, can you take a hand and get your food? And they're like, well, I don't know. So you're learning a lot of people are really excited to get to these events, but by doing the race day readies, like, especially the day before we're out on the course and I'm like, Hey, are you having to stop to get your fuel out? Yeah. I don't have it anywhere. Okay. Can you, let's try to open your packages and put it in your pocket. And I think even this Bakersfield one, the next day, probably three people came up to me and like, that was a game changer. Cause I could get my food on the fly. And I was yeah. like, that, that to me makes it worth it doing these like clinics or these ride alongs or just kind of helping show because when you see someone and Dirk, you can probably see this too. You ride with an athlete that you've never met before. Right. And you ride with them for the first time, 10 minutes of pedaling with this athlete is like A reading lifetime. their blueprint. I'm like, aha, <laughs> light bulb, light bulb, light bulb. And I'm like, Oh, this is going to get good now. Now we can actually like make some progress. Cause I just saw you in action. Um, yeah. So that's been really beneficial. And a lot of the people, they might not be our athletes, but they're, friends or people we've met over the years or people that, you know, Brian's partnered with Bianchi. So like the one in the, in Bakersfield was the rock collar presented by Bianchi. Right. So some of this is like, Hey, we're getting in there. These are free for people to join. We're highlighting the partners that have, have bought in, you know, are supporting us as, as, as athletes and as a company. And so you see kind of that reciprocity over the years has been like super powerful. <laughs> Yeah, I think gaining experience from a coach or somebody that's been there, done that is so, so big. I mean, again, I've have, had experiences where I was going to do a course I'd never done before. I didn't have a chance to pre, you know, preview it at all. But there was a virtual Facebook meeting, you know, with a coach the Wednesday night 
you know, the race is Sunday, but Wednesday night, you know, is a 6 p.m. virtual meeting. And we got you got to listen to a coach go through the course and some highlights of what they would expect you to see. Um, and then we got to pose our questions, you know, to the coach. And that was enormous for me because I would have been completely lost, not knowing at all what's what's around the bend. You know, and it's not yeah. the details of every single corner, but it's the, the highlights that, you know, the insights can really I mean, literally, that saved me 40 minutes right there. Just that Wednesday night meeting, you know, gave me so much insight into that course that it helped me so much. So, you know, coaches could do that as well. If you can't meet, you know, at the course, you know, doing a virtual, I think more races should try and provide that for the athletes um, to give them a better experience and to be better prepared mentally, you know, to show up on race day ready. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, one thing I wanted to add to your point, Dirk, was when we're talking about these grand events uh, for gravel and don't think of it as like, oh, it's relative to the distance. It's relative to the difficulty in the individual athlete. For some people, 100K gravel and 5,000 feet is that's a lot, right? That's a lot. That's not something they just tap out on a weekend. Okay. Yeah. One thing that is really important that we try to do with race day ready is we always try to help the individual athlete kind of where they're at in the ecosystem. Okay. I always like to think of it like there's kind of three people out on course. There's the person that's just there to complete the event. Like I'm new here. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to walk the feed zones. I'm going to do the dirt frill. I'm walking the feed zones. Okay? There's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of photo dumps. After. That's okay. Right. That's okay. If you're that person, embrace it. We love you. And I'm telling you that from the bottom of my heart, we love you. Thank you. Please come back. Right. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Okay. Then there's the second kind of person that's like, Hey, I've been here before. I know what's going on. Last year I did a six hour today. I'm going to do a 540. So they're racing themselves for a PR. Okay. If that's you, I want to, as a coach, I want to empower you to be like, okay, how do we get to 538 at the finish line? And you're like, man, I even beat my best expectations. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there's the people, there's another layer. There's the people that are there to race themselves and the competition, right? They're racing the course, their, their competition, and they're competing at the, at the pointy end of the race. If that's you, great. Let's figure out how we become successful in that scenario, okay? But where I find that there's so much trouble is people feel an expectation that everyone should be at the pointy end of the race or that they should be racing the race, and what I'm trying to say is like, no, there's kind of three things going out here. And you know this being um, having done triathlon and running, many people who come to a marathon, like that's baked in the cake. There's people that are like, hey, we're just here to finish. There's, yeah. hey, I'm here. I'm really trying to go sub three hours at a marathon. And then there's people that are like, I'm trying to set the course record, right? And that's just all baked in the cake at a marathon. And so gravel is essentially that same thing. And what I want as a coach is to help people recognize you're competing against yourself yesterday or last week or last year. We're trying to be better there. You can't always compete against the guy next to you because I don't know what his yesterday was. Oh, turns out that guy was, you know, collegiate national running champion. Well, you know, hey, I was 180 pounds and lost 40, whatever, you know? So again, I always think where do people fit in the ecosystem and then help them progress however they want to progress. It's not my job to say, Hey, everyone needs to be at the front of the race. That's not for everybody. What I want for everyone is to have their best ride. And that's really why we put together race day ready was to help take some of the anxiety off of it and be like, it's totally cool that I'm here to just finish. And how can we help you have a successful experience that how do I race myself and even smash my best expectations or my highest expectations? What does that look like? Yeah, no, that's awesome. I mean, to know, as you said, who you are within the community and to be good with that and yeah. race, you know, set those goals for your own personal, wherever you are at is awesome. And I've, I've had experiences where I had the goal to hopefully be top 10 completely messed up mechanically. <laughs> I did take my chain off and reattach the chain. And now I'm like, okay, I have 90 miles to go. You know, I'm going to find a group and have a fun day, you know, yeah, and you just, celebrate. you just have to like change it in the moment and say, okay, today's not my day for the performance, but I can have a great fun time. And that's the beauty 
you know, of gravel. Also, many mountain bike races yeah. are like that as well. They're not all segre- you know, um, you know, grouped by masters or elite, et cetera. You know, um, I'm doing Breck Epic three day this cool. year. So that's that's kind of a mass start fun mountain bike race. So you can make it fun. It's also yeah. grueling, grueling. Yeah, hard. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd love, I need to, you know, to wrap things up, you know, you guys, how about any retro, like do you, advice that you give to athletes in terms of after the race and retroing what went well and bad? Is that um, a... Yeah, I, that- oh yeah. I love data. So, you know, we, we don't, we don't push the data. Um, I, so the data for review, okay, for empirical data standpoint has been markedly helpful. And that's where I'll actually zoom with people, like, especially like, um, you look and see, because then again, the proof's in the pudding. Okay. So if someone, and what's funny too, is like the rollout at these events, they're like, well, I didn't feel like I was going hard. I could have gone harder. And I'm like, bro, your data, that was a 0.9. <laughs> you were railing. Like you sent a 20 minute, like you sent your FTP on the rollout. Right. And this is, that's a little extreme, but you know, like I, <laughs> like there, it's funny, but it's so impactful. And they're like, wow. I didn't, I was like, first of all, congratulations for your new power PR, right? You get training a little, just got harder. yeah, you get yeah, training just got <laughs> it should, harder. It should happen on race day. Yeah. It should, <laughs> yeah. So, um, when you're, yeah, so it's, but looking at like, okay, if you burn this many KJs in this first, in that 90 minutes, what did you eat? Okay. How was your breakfast? How was your prep? How was all these things? And they're like, well, I didn't really, I had two full bottles, like, and I didn't drink any of it. And now you're like, okay, like it's okay. Mistakes are totally fine. But now let's again, recalibrate and let's fine tune that for the next one. So you're going to actually have to practice eating on your group ride or let's keep, you're going to get a governor, especially on these longer ones for how hard you can go, you know, whether it's heart rate or um, power, some people, you know, just knowing that RPE, RPE can be really impactful on gravel because like, personally, I just have heart rate on my gravel bike, but I'm also been riding my bike for like a long time. And so I know like, "Mm, I'm riding a little bit too hard now. I should slow down. But so many of our athletes don't have that. So you show them the data, right? And then say, if we literally tweaked your pacing and your nutrition, you could go next Sunday, do the exact same event with zero improvement in your FTP and take off like 20, 30 minutes. Right. Literally. Yeah. Like you don't have to get more fit. You have to be smarter. Let's have a better pacing thing. And that's where we, we try to pregame it. Like to be like, this is what this course does. This is what, um, you know, that's why it's super exciting. They went down to do the San Dimas courses. I was like, Ooh, 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 we know how to like really like dig into these. Cause we know these routes, but yeah, the, the after what yesterday, Brian was on the phone literally all day. Cause we had like 25 athletes racing in all these different places on Saturday or Sunday. Mm-hmm. And so Monday's like, okay, I'm going to get an extra pot of coffee because now we're going to do the redux with everyone of the good, bad, and the ugly. And how can we reboot? Because next weekend's Tour Marietta. We got more racing to do, so let's fix it. Yeah, awesome. Well, keep in mind, right? We, like, with Joy and I, when we started the business, the business was always and has always been about how powerfully you ride a bicycle is important but how skillfully you ride a bicycle is of equal importance and equally influences the outcome of the day. Okay. So what we came up with was we're going to pregame this, right? That's the race day ready mindset, right? Then we have the event and then we can come back and we can debrief. We always love the debrief because after then we find out what happened, what went well, what didn't, what lessons are we going to learn? And, if you guys, you know, anybody who's a fan of sport, you all know that you learn more. Most people learn more when they lose rather than they when they win, right? Because when they win, it's like, hey, we won. We achieved our goal. Everything went great. But when yeah. we lose, we have to take a hard look at ourselves and say, you know what, coach? You told me I needed to eat. Coach, you told me I had to be top 10 going into that, that area, uh, that choke point right? That single track or that gravel sector. And I flatted because I was on the wheel and I hit a rock, right? Mm -hmm. And so it will help us make the appropriate changes so that we can have success next time. And so again, that's where 
I think coming from the road, one thing that I would like to see happen more in gravel events is us have kind of like appetizer type events. Not that every gravel event has to be the hundred miler. We need more like, and you'll appreciate this, but like if Perry Roubaix and Tour of Flanders are the classics, we need more semi-classics. Why? <laughs> we need semi-classics so that we can learn, we can make mistakes, make the changes and move forward. And so that to me is why the debrief is so important and why we wanted to go to events to help our athletes be successful because there's so many lessons to be learned there. Not just nutrition, not just pacing. Sometimes it's equipment. You tried something and you thought, hey, I thought these narrower tires were gonna roll faster. Surprise, when you get a flat, <laughs> nothing rolls fast, right? Yeah. So again, yeah. these things are very important and cycling is a sport. I mean, really all endurance sport is like this, but certainly cycling is a very, very complex sport. And it takes a sophisticated understanding of self, equipment, event, the, the conditions of the road, all of those things to be successful. OK, and when we go there and when we're new, we have to admit that we're unsophisticated. OK, that's just the way it is. We're new. OK, and you can be two years into this and be new. And oh, that's yeah. OK. Well, you're a young, you're a young cyclist. And if you look at like the athlete feedback, I think, Dirk, to your question about the, the debrief, that athlete post activity comment section. OK, <laughs> that right. Dear, that dear diary is gold <laughs> because. <laughs> I can look at data all day, but now we see like the, I flatted and I'm chasing, right? That's why, you know, and, and you know, we had athletes this weekend, you know, instantly they look at their deficits. They're like, Hey, you know, joy, I'm really terrible at my climbing. Um, you know, I I'm really terrible at climbing. And, and so we need to work on you. You haven't been coaching me on climbing. You haven't been training my climbing. Right. And I'm like, okay, cool. So let's look at your data. I'm like, well, you let it out for 5K and you don't have any teammates. And then you went to the base of the climb and then you were already riding threshold before you got to the climb. So of course your climbing was terrible. And they're like, no. Yeah. You know, so you, you kind of back work. It's like, hey, if you want to be good on the climb. So looking at that stuff is is really helpful. And then looking too is like um, looking at the race data and where the deficit was, like where are the chinks in the armor? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and that could be from the coaching side too. Like, how could I have prepared you better for that? Or what drills? And so um, funny, <laughs> like I just got a text come across on here that was like, that was the hardest workout I've ever done today. Now that gentleman got that workout because of how he performed on the San Dimas circuit race and where his gaps were. So I was like, cool, now you're ready and open to working your deficits, let's go. So, so you're, you're working during the interview, I love it. Yeah, I don't know how to, I mean, I know how to turn it off, but I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> That's all right. It's the life of a coach. Yeah. So, That's so yeah, awesome. putting that into, into action is, again, the athlete feedback, again, to really validate the importance of you as the athlete, what you think, feel, assume, and experience is going to guide where we, where we go and how we engage with you. What we prioritize. Because we want you here for the long term because our retention rate is very high. And we, that is because we really value your feedback as an athlete. We care. Yeah, we care. Yeah. We want to see people be successful. And like that takes a performance team and, and it, it is truly teamwork. Right. And so you can't you can't just get that through data. You have to get that through having a personal connection with people. And again, that's it's beautiful that we have a tool like Training Peaks to be able to allow us to look at all of these different channels of data and then be able to have the human asset and be able to say, OK, let's paint something beautiful. Right. Yeah, we're not we're not here to replace in person coaching. We want to enhance it and subject. Yeah, well, you data. do. Oh, come on, subjective you guys. Data is very important. Yeah, you guys do great though, Dirk. Come on, that's always been well, your. Thank you. you too. Oh. Hey, to wrap things up, how can people find you? Your website? Are you on social? <laughs> we're everywhere. Big Wheel Coaching. <laughs> so Big Wheel Coaching, it's very, it's like it's like the little Big Wheel, you know. Yeah, I love it. Fun riding the big wheel as a kid, yeah. Yes. We with got, the streamers, we got streamers, we got all the things. So, um, and we work with athletes of literally all levels. We have thirteen-year-olds through seventy-two-year-olds of gravel, road, um, time trial, time trial, mountain, elite, cyclocross, elite beginner, etc. So, fondo, bigwheelcoaching.com, bigwheelcoaching on the Instagram, nice. Facebook for our forty-plus crowd. <laughs> so. <laughs> which are still active on Facebook. So that's why you're not over 75. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I'm Joy on bike and he's BMC on bike. 
because yeah. Brian McCulloch on bike. So, yeah. yeah. If, if anybody awesome. has any questions, Dirk, like, please, uh, whether it's other coaches or um, athletes or anything like that, if there's something that we can help, we just, we view our business, we're a service business. We're not selling a product. We're here to serve, right? And it's kind of our highest calling is to help others. And so it's just our passion, what we love to do. Um, and so through Big Wheel Coaching, it gives us the opportunity and we have great partners like Training Peaks that allow us to make that happen. So again, if anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're yeah. happy to help um, in whatever um, way that might be. Yeah. We want to see you be successful. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll hopefully see you in person someday. Last time I saw you was during Endurance Coach Summit, I believe, a few years ago. So hopefully see you soon. Good luck to all your athletes uh, this year. And thanks for all the tips. Awesome. Thank you, Dirk, for having us.